Hi, and welcome to another Tom Ray's Art Podcast. I'm Tom. Today, I am talking to an artist that I met when I went overseas to the Ubuntu Summit. So if you've been following my webcomic or if you've seen it on the blog or my Instagram, I recently got the opportunity to speak at a conference, an open source conference for Ubuntu, which is a Linux operating system. And they wanted me to talk because my band is a Creative Commons band that only uses open source software. So not only did we perform there as a band because of this, but I got to give a talk about the importance of free and open source software for creators and musicians and what it means to us. And I also did a workshop with my band about a way that we came up with sharing and collaborating music while being remote. During the pandemic, I came up with a method for us to actually write and record songs on the internet through GitHub and uh, Ardor and the Ubuntu operating system that we use. And that actually got me flown to <laughs> flown to Europe. Anyway, that's not what this is about. What it's about is while I was there, I met another artist who also uses free and open source software and is an, uh, someone from Turkey. And they were there doing a talk about how they use different types of software and how they uh, create things and manipulate things, not just for art, but the software itself to create these pieces that they make. And it's a great conversation. During the during the summit that I was at, I didn't really get a chance to sit down with them. Uh, we kind of met in passing or we were off to go do one thing and they were off to do another or I watched their talk and they watched my talk. So I really wanted to have a chance to sit down and just talk art and creating with this person. And I finally did. And we did it over this podcast. This particular podcast isn't over video. It is just an audio podcast, but it was a great conversation. So here's my podcast starting right now. My name is Adil Dorel, and um, I am an uh, independent artist and uh, uh, educator and uh, open source software volunteer. And we met in Prague. Uh, at the yes, Ubuntu right. Summit pro, uh, conference, and I was it, when when I actually got the invite, I was looking at all the stuff, and I'm like, going, okay, tech stuff. Here's something that's interesting, and there are a few people I want to see. But I was like, oh, there's going to be an artist there, and you actually found me the first day <laughs> and introduced yourself, and I was like, that's it. like I didn't even realize I was talking to you, and you were being very nice. You're a very nice person, and then you're like, I'm doing a talk here, and I'm like, oh, what's your talk about? And then. I was like, oh, you're the artist I wanted to meet. So it was like, <laughs> <laughs> it was right off the bat. It was so good to meet you. So for me, that was the same thing as well. Like, it's like I was looking through the content and seeing, oh, there's a musician. Oh, they're using Ubuntu, uh, Ubuntu Studio. And yeah. wait, they did what? <laughs> and then like, no, okay, I need to look into this because this is interesting. <laughs> yes. Um, I'm also like, I do know that like um, artist collaboration remotely is also an issue um, in visual arts. So I was especially interested in that talk and like, wait, what how did they do this and so yeah and we'll get into that because first i want to get some background on you for people so you you're an independent artist now explain uh what would you say the style of your art is because i know you work in a lot of different mediums so so, uh, so explain it yeah i work with a um a variety of media so i work with photography i work with uh creative code and i work with a uh, digital like a uh, traditional medium so i work with like um pen and uh, like uh, watercolor and uh, uh, paper. I work with like pencils and paper, markers I used to work with, um, occasionally acrylic and canvas. Uh, so I work with all of these mediums and probably one of the more common themes across my art, my artistic practice is uh, this idea of style, styles and mediums and transferring styles of one medium to another. Uh, media. So, for example, making a creative code look like a painting, or mm -hmm. making a painting look like it's been generated by an algorithm, or making a photograph look like a painting, or making a... So, all of these, um, you know, transfers or movements between different media, and because each media has their style, some of it has to do with the medium itself, technically, but it also has to do with the culture that it came from, the artistic practice it came from. So, it's fun to play around with that my work isn't only about that, so mm. there is topics and um, ideas that is behind it. But uh, if I have to say one thing that is like tying across all of my artistic practice over the last uh, twenty plus years, that's that. 
Yeah. And when, how did you, so how did you get started in that? That you don't just wake up one day and go, well, here's what I'm going to do. <laughs> how did it evolve um, into that type of work? Like, how did you first start out? Did you, uh, to, did you just start to the drawing? the risk of sounding ridiculously corny, like, um, okay. it is a childhood story. I started doing photography when I was, um, like, uh, 12, 13, uh -huh. because I couldn't draw. For the longest time, I thought that I couldn't draw. Like, I couldn't, like, draw nice pictures, etc. I did not realize that that was a skill. By the way, if any of you who are listening are wondering about that, drawing realistically is a skill. Uh -huh. It is not talent, <laughs> just to clarify. <laughs> um, but I didn't know that, so um, I started doing photography and tried to use photography as a way to express what ideas I had in my own brain. So I guess that's, like, one of the – that's where I started problem-solving. But I guess this is just how my brain works. Like, if I want to do photography, like, I'm always interested in this idea of, like, how can I use something wrong? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So um, that's, that was just, genuine, like, a natural continuation of that, I guess. Uh, but when did I start being conscious about that? I think it was in university. Um, I was taking a digital art class, and I had this idea of using user interfaces um, to not make a user interface or an, a flash interactive uh, interface as useful and easy to use as possible, but actually difficult, uh, but uh, in, to convey an emotion. This okay. was called wall. I'm sorry for the original naming, not. No, that's okay. uh, and uh, it was an, um, you know, it was a, a work that was about mental health and uh, like that first person experience of mental health and uh, what it feels like. By the way, just to clarify, this was in 2003 before like yeah. ACI and like, you know, was bar uh, just starting to be discussed, like media arts uh, and sciences, like that type of thing was just starting to be discussed. Yeah. So um, yeah, that's where I first, I think became conscious that I had some awareness that when I was in high school doing, uh, I was using website design as an art medium. Right. And that was happening within that context of that subculture of website design artist website website design that i kind of was interacting with other people who did similar stuff yeah uh, but yeah the consciousness and the awareness of what i was doing happened i think somewhere around college gradually okay yeah it's, uh, it's so that's interesting the so 2003 that's before uh smartphones and all that stuff and you're saying yeah. you were essentially doing ui user interactive which even websites were not mobile. They were tables. And when you designed them, you know, some people would use Dreamweaver. It was just like boxes and images you would put on a screen. Yes. And you're saying you were in or you were designing something where it's like, here's buttons you push, but they were to make you feel like you were going crazy or everything was useless and to generate frustration. I, yeah. That's like the interaction, that was something I was thinking on my own. And like later I learned that there was a whole field called ACI, human computer interaction. Yeah. At that point it was existing, uh, but um, you know, it wasn't something I knew and I hadn't seen any examples definitely of people using that no, idea. No, UI was not a well-known thing back then. That was, it was yeah. not something, that, I mean, it was a thing, but it wasn't something that everybody knew about in every job was looking for. Like right now, everybody wants a UI artist because yeah. it's like, we need that. Huh. And that happened very gradually, but yeah, I mean, it was, it was exists in the academic environment. It did not exist in the more uh, like mainstream concept of this is something that we should do a priority. I haven't actually at the time saw any much use of it as an artistic practice that intentionally. Um, but the idea of you making a website as an artistic uh, work, I don't know how conscious it is, but it definitely existed as a culture, a digital culture. Um, mm -hmm artifact like you had these websites that were very image based very decorative and uh, very aesthetic so it wasn't just like you know putting a gift uh, here and there but actually making the whole website layout an art piece yeah. to the point that the content it was almost like scrapbooking but digital sc uh, scrapbooking yeah very much so and and even so, now a lot of the software that people have that is what it is it's just drag and drop the things you need like they're already pre-built for you and that that probably wasn't a thing like you know, the objects oh, no. and settings that you were in there <laughs> like front page and such existed but like part of the reason I started using HTML was trying to debug um, front page at the time so. <laughs> right um, I went to do, like the code to debug stuff so often that I accidentally learned how to uh, write html that's exactly so. what happened with me i got a free website and i wanted to do something to it and i was like well i don't have anything to do i'm gonna figure this out and i i was looking through i mean i yeah i was breaking the site left and right and then all of a sudden realized how to write code basically by 
by messing with a free site that I had. And then all of a sudden became a web developer for a while. So were you, <laughs> did you have a, it, was this your uh, develop, not developmental, but your uh, coding background? Like, did you, had you done anything like that beforehand? Or was it just really like, I wanted to learn how to use front page and that's what started it all. Like, had you that's been- That's what I wanted, I didn't want to even learn how to use a front page. I just wanted to create my website and put up the stuff I was doing online. That was it, like, again, high school student. Yeah. <laughs> Actually, like early high school student. So um, I did have to take a couple of years out uh, off the international entrance exams for the university so um okay. but yeah like that's what it was and in university that continued to a point okay um main bulk of uh, learning how to program happened in university so in college and um uh, i did a computer science degree and right. then uh you know at the same time i did a double major in media arts and sciences which was at the time again you know okay. this idea of digital um art in uh, undergraduate level was relatively new at the time. So there was a few places that did, but not a lot of them. All right. And how did your, so how did your art evolve from there? How did it grow into like you doing more of it, doing different styles of it? Uh, you said when you started out, you did photography because you didn't think you could draw, but then eventually a lot of the stuff on your site is very much mixed media and drawings and animation. So how did that evolve into those different realms? I am basically a cautionary tale okay. of how you become an artist because you cannot stop doing art. I had no idea. If you asked me to the university um, student, Aiden, what is your career um, work? My idea would have been, oh, I'm going to do computer science. I'm going to, do, going to do art on the side because you do not do art for work, right? A lot of people that, say that. That's just yeah. what okay. Um, so uh, um, I kept taking art classes because I realized that it was something that was benefiting me. It was something that I was productive in. It made me productive in other classes. So I kept taking art classes. And um, uh, my university that semester just started uh, get, uh, take, um, you know, offering digital art classes. We had one instructor who did that, um, one lecturer who uh, did it. So I started taking digital art. At the same time, I took 2D design. The next thing I know, I took like a digital audio class next thing i know after that i took another digital art class um uh, i went to wellesley um so we, we had exchange classes at mit so i took an a dish, like um digital poem class and like it's just like built up and i kept doing this body of work that um was just like one semester i decided on my own i'm going to do like you know take the assignments from both of these uh classes and i'm going to actually turn this into a major project I still thinking that art is a hobby at this uh, mm -hmm. stage. Okay. So um, I took uh, eventually on the senior year, I realized like, you know what? Like I'm on my senior year, I might not take another art class again. Let me take drawing class. I was doing abstract art at that point. Uh, I did not realize like for me it was uh, like I did abstract art uh, since again high school, middle school, mm -hmm. actually earlier, but I did not consider that a skill and. Um, like, I didn't realize that, I always had this idea that if you are not drawing realistically, you are not an uh, artist who was using a drawing as a medium. It just doesn't happen. Again, we are talking about 20 years ago, 30 years ago. Yeah. Um, so, and I didn't have a lot of people who could, I think my high school art teacher had a realization of what was happening, mm -hmm. but uh, I did not. Okay. I definitely did not. Uh, so, uh, like, because that, the art that I was doing wasn't really, looking like anything that I was seeing around in Turkey at the What time. was it so, like? Um, uh, you saw a lot more realistic art, some contemporary art, but you did not see a lot of like abstract artists okay. as far as I could tell. I mean, I'm sure there were, it's just like I wasn't seeing them. Again, okay. we are talking about the time that was mostly pre-internet. Right. So you weren't, it wasn't so, like everybody was sharing the stuff. You'd ha you would have to go seek it yeah. out. Okay. Yeah. So, um, but yeah, so... It, gradually realized that you know i'm doing this i keep doing this i should take drawing class so i took a realistic drawing class even before that i was doing some illustrations um it's just was again it was very gradual like i am looking back and saying i was doing this at the time i had no idea what i was doing mm -hmm. i just kept drawing i kept making abstract art i kept doing strange stuff with flash i kept doing composing random little pieces of music then that I used as my soundtrack or the sound design of my work. I was experimenting left and right on my, um, like I did a 
sort of like a small finishing project that was an art installation that was under the computer science department. I didn't know what was going on <laughs> at the time. Okay. So um, I, that continued all the way until I was 25. Like I quit a graduate degree in uh, computer science because that's when I hit the ceiling of, oh, this is easy. I can do this. You know, I can do my day job on the side. And at the same time, I can do art. Uh, a PhD requires a very serious commitment. And yeah. uh, when I was forced to make that commitment is when I realized, wait a second, I'm in the wrong um, field. I oh. had, I was working on a research top, uh, research that, um, that was like on programming education. Okay. And I had these prototypes and I realized, wait, like one night I'm sitting and like looking at these prototypes that I'm making. Then I realized I'm more interested in the aesthetics of the uh, prototypes mm. than the research we are doing. I think that was a light bulb of, oh no, I'm on the wrong field. Huh. I am definitely on the wrong field and I may need to make a change. So what did you do? <laughs> I quit the grad program. Yeah. With no degree. I came back to Istanbul uh -huh. with like maybe one uh, you know, school I could apply to without an art degree. Mm -hmm. I got into that MFA. Uh, I did not finish it, by the way, just to clarify. <laughs> um, okay. That's a different story. <laughs> and then um, it was probably the most stressful thing I have done because like, it was just like leaping into the unknown. I have no idea that like, I'm leaving this high idea of like good paying job prospects and doing this thing. And I have no idea what it is that I'm doing. Um, so uh, for the context at the time, this is 2011, Istanbul is an, um, you know, a center of art, like sort of like, it's a very active art hub. Okay. So like I'm, so that was the context of, that was part of why I came back to Istanbul. And, um, but yeah, so I, that, the rest is history. Yeah. And I, that's, that's a good point. I have no idea what the art community is like in Istanbul. It, it's it, what you do a lot of stuff in galleries. What is the, tell me about the art community there. I'm fascinated by that. Cause I've, I have um, no clue. It's like, um, definitely it was a bit more vibrant back then. Like, Tend, these uh, hubs tend to move over time. So okay. in around 2011, 2012, uh, Istanbul was a hub. Now there are other centers. And I think that with the pandemic, mm. a lot of like in-person art activity took a very serious hit globally. That's a good point. Um, so it definitely still exists. It is very contemporary art. We are now more seeing more digital and electronic art. Uh, mm. But actually, the works that I have shown um, has usually been on uh, international Exhibits, like, international events. I went to a few ICS, um, International Symposium, Symposium of Electronic Arts, oh. um, and like a various, uh, uh, what's it called? Various uh, exhibits here and there, or you know, activities here and there. Uh, a couple of online exhibits. So, yeah, it's just something that some occasionally happens. It's not the main thing. I consider myself more showing bulk of my work online and interacting with people directly. And how do you do that? What what are some of the ways that you go about showing your work online? Um, honestly, these days, uh, Mastodon is really picked up and um, the Fediverse in Mastodon, that's probably where I primarily have been. Mm -hmm. And um, both, and this is where like the whole idea of art and advocacy for open source software kind of merged together. I started this thing called Edit Backlog. It was just a way to for me to go through the giant list of photographs that I had that I, I had never edited or never looked back at. Oh, yeah. Like digital and some analog, but mostly digital photographs. And going through them and just this idea that you can do photography out of a time and, you know, you don't have to immediately show a photograph can have a value outside of its own period. And I started just randomly taking old photographs, re-editing them, rethinking them, and in some ways recreating them because in many ways, digital photography, any photography is um, created. It is not taken. Mm -hmm. Some people will disagree with me, people who does more traditional photography, but this is what, what I tell my students often. Okay. If an image, a photograph is created. It is not taken. Um, there is always a point of view of the artist there is always the point of view of the um even if you are not doing any edit the way that you compose the image the, the what you decide to put in what you don't decide to put in the uh, composition the light the exposure choices camera angle camera position all of those those things really affect the story you are telling and the more you are conscious about your story the more powerful of a photograph you can uh, take okay and by the way when i say story i don't necessarily mean a social narrative. It can be 
your story might be about the forms that you see, mm -hmm. that you are picturing. It might be about a texture you create in an abstract photograph. So it, like when I'm talking about the narrative, I say this very broadly. Yeah. Anyway, I got sidetracked. So edit That's battle okay. You're a teacher. I get it. You're explaining. I yeah, want sorry. you to explain <laughs> this it. This is what I tell to my students. So I kind of like autopiloted <laughs> back and there. Right. Uh, but that is important. And like edit backlog in many ways was that. And um, I started to uh, put this up. But at the same time, uh, I put one idea that said, hey, I have this tag, like art with open source software. Other people should use that. Mm -hmm. um, in the tiny scale of Mastodon back in the days, now it's a lot larger, mm -hmm. uh, it went a little bit viral. And next thing I knew, I was actually consciously talking about art, making art with open source software, and that you can do professional level art with open source software. By the way, just to clarify, I am not the first person to do this. There is a whole uh, forum of uh, photographers who use open source software, Pixels Us. Yeah. Uh, there is amazing illustrators like David Romero, for example, who does work like this. So, um, but I, especially what I hadn't seen was contemporary art and the use of open source software in contemporary art, especially in the industri uh, industry side of the art and the gallery side of art. People don't even realize this is an option. Mm -hmm. And like, even on the, for example, when I went to ICEA, I would have seen people who use processing, for example, processing is a uh, language that is designed, Java-based language that is designed for artists and designers. Oh. Um, so they will be using that and they will be using open source technology, but really not naming that. So there was this complete lack of awareness that you can do art, mm -hmm. high level, good quality art with open source software without it being the lesser option. Yeah. That part, Lesser option is something that still I see people stumble upon. They assume that, oh, this is something of a challenge. No, I swapped open source software because I'm getting frustrated by the closed source stuff. Right. And you can't so, alter it or manipulate it from inside. Uh, and you're saying like even the, the programmically what it does, you're saying you have the ability to change it yourself. Uh, yes. Yeah. And like, it's not like when I'm saying, okay, even when I was starting to teach in 2018, what I said was, Oh, like you have the option of changing the software, but it goes beyond that. Mm -hmm. It is the open software culture where the idea is that users are part of the community, mm -hmm. and that that inter that you don't have this distinct uh, difference between people who use the software and people who create the software. Those two things kind of overlap or like become a gradient almost. Mm -hmm. You might have users who are giving uh, bug reports. You might have people who are doing user studies. You might have people who are occasionally contributing to code or writing scripts around it. So it becomes this whole ecosystem where it is not the company or one person running the narrative. It is a collective of people running the narrative almost and deciding what a software can be mm -hmm. and what is needed. So that was kind of what brought me in. Another huge part is open document formats. I lost a whole host of like old work including some of the ones I mentioned here, uh, to software vanishing and they're in sunset. Oh, and yeah. Yes. Oh, my goodness. So I've had that happen. It, <laughs> suddenly, like, you know, the tool that you are using is literally, it doesn't matter that you want to pay the money, it is not accessible to you. Being a, uh, a guy uh, who works in audio, that happened for many years. Audio codecs and video codecs over the years, it was like, this is what we're going to use. And everybody, like, there was the real player, there was the real time player, then it got bought by another company and the audio codec wasn't available. Like, that was... Thankfully, at least now there's like just a few formats and there's no real codex involved or it's like the codex became universal, but there was like, you had to have a certain player for like, I have videos and audio that I can't, that I have saved on a hard drive that I can't even play anymore because nothing, well, sometimes VLC player will do it, which again, open source. Uh, but you know, it's, oh, it's, I know exactly what you mean. I've lost so many things just because it's like, no, this is the one we're going to use now. No, and then it got bought out after a year. And that, again, is because it's being maintained by a corporation and not being maintained like, oh, if somebody else wants to take over this because we're not, we're not going to support it anymore, somebody can fork the software and actually start building it themselves, which has happened on many occasions, you know? Yes. Yeah. And so let me ask you a question about uh, you were going to these uh, showings and you were doing online stuff. How do you submit or find play, uh, things to submit your work to? Um, there are definitely, uh, for example, Facebook groups that will tell you open uh, calls 
but like if you know about certain events like there are well known events the uh, various biennials uh, symposiums uh, you know yearly events that you will be aware as an artist and you do apply to them personally some do tend to become invite only but most of them usually they do accept open calls so you just go and apply to them yeah uh, it's as simple as that um and where do you find these events it's a mixture of you go to an event and experience as a you uh, as an audience you know that it exists um if you are in art school for any length of time at any point you will see these things being com- uh, talked about you will see your classmates or your instructors guiding you to that's kind of where the bootstrapping happens like okay. where, that's where you start seeing it but the moment you start building those networks and the more you start looking for them you start finding them but of course like you know there's definitely uh some non-existent or fake cases out there but oh, like um if you are an, like if you do this regularly it as if like it's the same thing as like you know how do you know to apply to an uh, grant as a scientist how do you know to apply to an um uh, to some sort of funding as a non-profit it's the same idea yeah. like you you are in that domain you kind of acquire that knowledge gradually so you apply for grants is what you're saying a lot of the time um not so much no but like okay. i was talking more about the non-profits will apply to gotcha. grants. Like it's similar okay. to that like how do you apply to um art uh, and of course like uh, people who does work to a point and really work with um, institutions to that point all right occasionally yeah. also get invited but um yeah okay a, a lot of the stuff is open call similar to how you will apply to a conference as an, in academics my biggest same. problem is when i see things that i could submit to i'm like mm-hmm. and it's probably just because i should i should figure it out i'm sure you might have a a set thing that you send out but i'm always like oh what do i send how do i write something how, like i'm not good at the submission part i don't know what to put down i don't have anything pre-set up like are there any tips for what people should use to submit to these things or do you just go hey check out my stuff do you have a link you send them to like what do you usually send to apply for these things i know a lot of contemporary art things so this is what i can talk for different areas have different uh solutions for different uh, situations for, for example on photography, there are yearly, usually competitions you can submit your work to. Okay. Um, and that that tends to be the big thing. And those are, for example, topic not topic specific, but they are time specific. So you often uh, have to send work that has been done in the last year. True. Uh, okay. So contemporary art, it's usually when you are ex- applying to an exhibit and there is an open call, there usually is a theme. Not always. There are definitely events, yearly events that has oh. no theme or uh-huh. very wide themes but you usually have some level of theme and uh, what happens is that often you either realize wait i have a work that's been sitting around that i have been uh, half finished or fully finished or that i can adapt or sort of like reiterate it on that is really really appropriate for this event and really really appra- appropriate for this topic or it might be that often you see this call often three or three months ago four months ago you often make a work that is for that dialogue. Mm-hmm. So you see the theme and you find the places where that overlaps with your own art, artistic practice and you come up with a work. Okay. So for example, um, when I did the solar plant, uh, you might have seen the example work that was done for um, a parallel, uh, parallel exhibit as part of the Istanbul Biennale in 2019 as part of my department it was an event that was held by the department I'm currently teaching at um in Itu and what they we had was an overall theme of the uh we had the overall uh, theme of the Biennale and then we had our own theme of that parallel uh, exhibit Mm -hmm. and all of us we were given a deadline um we were aware that this was happening those of us who wanted to uh participate and be part of this collective conversation sort of collective talk uh we all submitted our work Mm -hmm. and yes it can be stressful i had i was moving at the time i was like moving a house at the same time coming up with the work it was stressful (laughs) but like i got the work out and uh it is still my own work Mm -hmm. it is still something i cared about it was me interpreting the theme from the way i look at it and from within the larger dialogue of dialogue of um ideas that i was thinking about so it's kind of like um that's kind of how you do it yeah i don't know if this is helpful or not no no it is and and actually it didn't even occur to me the whole 
the the theming i guess i've i've run into that but it i i forget that like sometimes there are even around here there are markets or pop-ups or events and usually they're themed around a time of season or uh, an event yeah no that's a good point and uh also showing the most recent work that i uh, that makes me think how much stuff do you create in a year i guess how much how much do you how much do you, I want to say make in a year, but that makes it sound like I'm asking how much money you make. How much art do you no, no, actually I, produce in a year? That's what I meant to say. That's a, that's a very tough one for me because um, I sometimes feel like I'm not creating a lot and then I go back and I'm like, what did I do? <laughs> uh, and uh, because like there is a huge accumulation of random things, what happens yeah. for me as a cycle is that there are times where I'm just like, I might not create any artwork, like isn't finished artwork for six months that i might be doing four works in quick succession whether putting putting that online or putting it out there the first year i was doing edit backlog i think i was like posting one photograph a day okay which is ridiculous pace but what was happening is that i had those works mm -hmm. i had taken those photographs some of them were worked on a little bit some of them actually was previously edited i was revisiting old work um when i'm working on an Sometimes what's happening is that, for example, last uh, and last spring, I haven't done any work at all. What was happening behind the scenes is that I was learning to use watercolor and pencils. I was switching from markers to those two because they're more light, fast, and more durable. Uh, so I was doing that transition. That required me to sit down. That's true. I have a lot of practice work that was done during that period, but it wasn't a finished work. But now yeah, learning actually, a new skill is actually still yes. part of the process. You're right. That's a very good point. Um, and that's true. And it, it, not putting stuff out online sometimes, you're right. It makes you feel like, oh, what have I even done? But it's like you've done all this stuff and learned a new skill. And when you put out three works in a row yeah. sometimes, okay. what's happening is that you're actually relying on the work that you have done two years prior. So it right. is really not even. Uh, but yeah, so I would say generally, um, yeah, I, it's hard to tell. So like, you know, are we talking about large works that are exhibited somewhere? Stuff that I'm just casually putting on the internet yeah. because I'm doing works with such a different scale at the same time, which by the way, is not true for everybody. It's just the way that I've been doing all over the map. Um, mm -hmm. Usually people are either more in the contemporary art star style, working with galleries exclusively, or they're just doing the Etsy shop route or just like, you know, posting things online. I am doing all of those things at once. It's right. partially due to the fact that I am working with all of these mediums that cater to different stuff. Uh, there's actually more ideas behind that as well. The idea of like, you know, uh, making the art visible to public and like, I'm not going to go into that because that's right. a whole different discussion. <laughs> uh, so it, and it will take two hours to explain. <laughs> so um, explain it without being mis like, you know, without like e explaining it well is uh, something that will take a long time. Gotcha. Uh, so, yeah, I'm uh, spending a lot, like, uh, it's really, really uneven for me that, like, you know, I will say maybe I'm in, an, uh, co like, in mixed, ex like, in a group exhibit or giving a talk or doing any of those things once or twice a year. Yeah. Sometimes it's two talks, sometimes one uh, exhibit, like, um, but sometimes there's a lot of stuff happening, sometimes there is none. It's all over the place, but then again, is this the only work I do? No. Like, I have to also account in the fact that how many works I'm putting on social media or, mm -hmm. you know, uh, what am I working on that I haven't published? Mm -hmm. Because there is that category as well. So it's all over the place. Yeah. It's all over the place. It depends on the size of the project. It depends on what medium I'm using. It depends on if I'm doing any sort of like experimentation, sort of like that input phase or am I at the output phase, like just producing phase that happens sometimes so it depends it yeah. really depends sometimes i'm more focused on teaching for example two years um 2018 to 2020 almost three years 2021 i was building a curriculum from start for uh, my photography class so that kind of took a lot of uh, energy mm -hmm. and i'm kind of like shifted almost away from my artistic practice full-time to just getting that working now i'm coming back into the advocacy and art styles so there is also those shifts. As an artist, you don't just do art often. Yeah. How Some did, people do. Again, how, I don't it, want to generalize, but... Yeah. And, and how did you start teaching? Uh, how, did, how did that begin? Um, how, sometimes this is hard to answer all of these questions because most I feel like sometimes most of the stuff that has happened in my life uh -huh. happened on 
strange accidents. No, that's that's perfectly um, fine. Actually, that's you would you would be surprised how many people are just like I don't know. Just one day it happened, and it's like ah, oh, gosh, so darn it. In this case, <laughs> um, I had the idea of teaching because I do like teaching. I had done. Um, I was in a teaching assistant when I was in uh, grad school. Still, I was um, you know doing tutoring and like teaching when I was an undergraduate level as well. Uh, so it was something that was always in my mind. But like 2017, 2018, I'm posting a lot of photographs into social media. That's like the height of the Edit Backlog project that was ongoing. There was an incident where, um, you know, I talked to, a de- to the de- my current department and they were looking for lecturers. And I was expecting to be teaching creative coding because at the time, creative coding is something that is, you know, becoming a bit prevalent and sick. Yeah. Uh, they weren't looking for any creative coding class. They were looking for a photographic class and actually I love to tell the story like I was thinking at the same time like this this was really funny because at the same time at the time I was talking a lot about how it is important to teach with open source software mm-hmm. and open source tools in university in um, in uh, during the education so that the students get used they do not get locked in into some vendors yeah this is something I was saying. At the same time, I'm trying to prepare the curriculum. I'm teaching a standard photography class that still needs to have the common outcome. Um, how am I going to make sure that this works? How am I going to make sure that, you know, these students have the correct skills that they can adapt it outside? Two weeks before the classes start, I realized, wait, I've been always saying that, you know, you should be doing, uh, you should, we should be teaching op- uh, art with open source, and I'm just doing that. Mm-hmm. I actually get to do this. I realized it's two weeks before the class. <laughs> so it hadn't even uh, occurred to you. <laughs> that no, is... <laughs> despite the fact that I was doing this and I, I was advocating for this, it did not occur to me that I was doing it. <laughs> so, yeah, like this is basically a life lesson. Like if you want to get, don't worry about what it is that you're going to do. Just do it. Okay. Just one at a time and see where it takes you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so, so so you started doing it through uh, the place you were already at, uh, and and then you had to um, how di- how did adapting to the classes when the global shutdown happened uh, work out for you? Like, uh, uh, how did you adapt to it? I I haven't had a chance to actually talk to a teacher. I've only been able to talk to people who were like, "This is how I'm going to communicate with people." But you actually had to keep teaching people. How did that work? <laughs> it was really interesting. It actually worked out well in the end. Uh, of course, like, you know, it was uh, very confusing because we did end up in the lockdown in the middle of the semester. Mm-hmm. Uh, one of the challenging aspects of the whole situation was that uh, a lot of my students were used to taking photographs outdoors. And honestly, oh. most of the photography I do is also outdoors. And I don't do a lot of studio photography as my... Uh, the the genre of photography I use as part of my, as part of my artistic practice is experimental or a landscape or you know astrophotography. Those are the things that I use a lot. Yeah. Uh, so this is what I taught and this is what they were also interested in. Midway through the se- semester, suddenly everyone is stuck in their homes. Mm-hmm. I had a panic students who were asking me, how are we going to do the assignments when we cannot leave the house? Uh, so three in the morning one night before the class i had this um you know set up with random how do you light an object indoors with oh. <laughs> everyday objects <laughs> okay everyday lightings how do you use a flashlight you do not need professional equipment like yes professional equipment is great but again this is that whole idea that you do not need to be beholden to specific tools mm-hmm. you can make your own tools and i think somewhere along the way especially on digital medium we somehow decided that this is not the case. For painting, we know to use unconventional materials. But oh, how, yeah. why do we think that we cannot do that for digital photography? Why do we feel that we cannot do that when we are uh, making illustrations? There is a whole genre of uh, mm-hmm. visual arts where you are editing an image with an audio software. Mm-hmm. And like, you can still make your own tools and this is not just about coding Mm -hmm. building a software that is from beginning to end it is hacking with it playing around with it making the artistic and creative decisions yourself not letting the software dictate it at the end of the day that is what it is about same with um lighting 
Yes, it is great to have professional quality equipment if you are doing this every day. But my reflector, even now if I need to use indoors, I have a foam board, uh-huh. a white foam board that I use as a reflector. It works. <laughs> That's you don't true. need to use equipment. You, right. It just works. So kind of like teaching them that. And once like, you know, everyone uh, got over the surprise, um, mm-hmm. I've seen some very creative work. So it worked fantastically. And I, okay. a part of me does miss, I like, I understand the fact that for students, they do like the face-to-face, but um, I think there was definitely a, a benefit to teaching online too. For example, the fact that uh, students can uh, come to the class, even if they're working part-time, uh, yeah. There is, uh, you know, even or even if you know they just are um, elsewhere and they cannot come, they might be slightly sick, but you know they can still attend the class. They can watch the recording, and you do not, uh, the students do not fall behind because the recording is there. What is challenging about online classes is that, and I think some that's what made online education not work for a lot of people. You do need to rethink your curriculum a lot. So you need to figure out how to give that uh, material to the student. Mm-hmm. And you need to be, you need to have a lot more uh, sort of digital material slides and interactions ready-made. Uh, you, on the classes, I can just, you know, uh, just pull a table, improvise, and <laughs> do true. what they need to do. Uh, or All right, like, gather you know, around, talk, everyone. The camera <laughs> angles, I can just get out the camera and show what they need to do. When I'm teaching digitally, yes, I can use the video, but what is better is that I do need to have photographs of that. Yeah. So it requires a bit more pre-planning. It is tougher to do in that respect. But I think there are also very strong benefits, especially for you know students coming from non-traditional tracks and um, you know people who are also working part-time, uh, which does happen. Mm-hmm. Uh, so there's definitely advantages to uh, um, both online teaching and in-person. And I wanted to uh, comment on the the one time that I was introduced or at least got the concept of using different software for different things. As far as photography, I talked mm-hmm. to years back, a glitch artist artist. And yes. that fascinated me. Cause I was like, Oh, that's so simple. And he would just basically take the photograph, the digital photograph, open it in a text document as I, I don't remember what he used, but there was something that he would use so he could open it. And it would just be like all the binary and whatever of the text image. And he would just, delete or change some of the numbers in it. And then when he opened up the image again, all of a sudden it was all kinds of messed up and just like the computer was reading it all wrong and all that stuff. And yeah, it's things like that. Like it's just thinking differently and using mediums. Like there's that kind of extreme. Like when you were saying, you know, uh, connecting or using different types of mediums with photography, it's like, it's a digital format and you can do things with that digital format rather than just like, Oh, I can open it in Photoshop and then maybe put vector on it. No, you're saying even going beyond that and using the software itself. Example, uh, The way that I use photography uh, software, for example, dark table for not photography. First yes, one this is, was in your talk. I remember I caught that. Yeah. <laughs> uh, the, oh no, I, I, I'm using a uh, Hugin for a uh, doc, like, taking multiple images of my uh, drawings and then stitching them together. Yes, that I yeah. did that. But this is uh, funnier. I actually did an um, animation in processing. This was actually put on Mastodon, I believe, in the early days. I need to re-put that to my newer account. Um, I, did the, I did the image, but I wanted to have some sort of local contrast on the edges of the image. And that is, to code that is really, really hard. Yeah. Uh, so what I did is I just output all of the frames, put them onto dark table, did the edit with the local contrast on one frame, just copied it on everything else, and then got the output, went back to processing, did the movie output, and it was done. Nice. This is not, I'm not using video editing software. Uh-huh. I am not using creative coding software. I'm just using photography software to just add an edit that I don't know how to code. Similarly, <laughs> um, I use um, Darktable as a post-processing uh, on sometimes when I'm illustrate, uh, doing little illustrations. Mm-hmm. Most of, if I'm posting a rare case that I'm posting an illustration, digital illustration online, I can guarantee you it went through a, a photo editing software because I am not a prime, I'm not a full time illustrator. I might not know how to use colors to that degree, but I know how to do photo editing. So I take the raw thing and just adjust the colors using the photography tool, which is, but this is what I'm talking about there. So yeah. using, deciding what you want to do as a vision and you being in control of the aesthetic, not 
the software itself. Yeah. Nice. So, I so love it's that. It's not only about the glitch. It you can even do oh, more yeah. conventional stuff still using software in unexpected ways. Yeah, the the glitch just kind of opened my mind to it and then go, "Oh, that's what the that's the thing type of thing you could think of to do." And that's that was the thing. It's like I wasn't connecting that dot. And then when I heard about the glitch thing, it was like, "Oh, I get it." And then it kind of expanded from there. It was like a tangent of the way to think about digital work. And it's like, oh, that's right. It's digital. Um, and then uh, I had one more thing I wanted to ask you about. So uh, are there any events or uh, projects or things that you have coming up that you'd like people to know about or anything in the works that you'd like to share about with us today? Um, at the moment, there isn't anything coming up. Okay. I'm working on some uh, more uh, structured things, for example, uh, a better way for people to uh, access my art at the moment that's what I'm working on because I have a huge amount of art that is actually creative commons that is not really accessible mm -hmm. um, so I'm working on my website and related topics right now that is my focus okay there is also another project that is incoming but that is a bit too early to talk about okay all right uh, <laughs> man that happens so many times it's like I can't tell you about yeah. it yet people do that all the time to me I'm Although sorry I, it's like um, I understand yeah, the I understand. problem is that like uh, in past I didn't make this mistake of saying I'm going to get this done and then yeah that thing doesn't get done because what you thought was like you know supposed to be a this size project like tiny right. project turns out to be a giant oh no one's uh, ever had that, that happen to them here so um <laughs> oh yeah Oops. well so, uh, okay and then if people wanted to check out your work uh where would you suggest they go to do that um i have my website slightly up updated at the moment but it's in the works it's uh eluldogral.com and uh, at the same time, I have my Mastodon account, which is social.adeldogrel.com slash adel. So if you go to my website, you'll be able to find the link from there. Uh, okay. So uh, those are probably the best ways to reach me. Uh, my Mastodon account is mirrored on Twitter. But um, if you really want to reach me and interact with me, probably Fediverse is the best place to do it. All right. Well, I want to thank you so much for talking with me. I'm glad we got to sit down and talk. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you.